good morning and welcome to worship with the South West Tyneside Methodist Circuit. Today we are marking the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, which this year takes as its theme the real lockdown. After the lockdown earlier in the year was eased, most of the churches in the circuit had begun to reopen for worship. What a joy it was to greet people in person and to hear one another's voices as we joined in prayer together. Perhaps it seems a bitter blow that we are prevented from meeting in church once more, albeit for just at four weeks. On this International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, we're encouraged to give thanks for the religious freedom we enjoy and to remember that countless people around the world have never known that freedom. Christian Solidarity Worldwide, a human rights organisation that advocates for freedom of religion or belief and seeks to stand alongside everyone facing injustice because of their religion or belief, highlights persecution Christians face in 2020. In India, many can't gather to pray in their homes for fear of attack. In China, even Christians who join online services risk arrest. This is the real lockdown, and it's not just temporary. We turn to words from the first letter to the Thessalonians to lead us into worship. Sisters and brothers, you are not in darkness, so that the day of the Lord should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light. So let us be sober, putting on faith and love like a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. I invite you to join in singing the hymn, Be Thou My Vision, which is played for us today by Christine Nelson and sung by April Lancaster. Thank you. 
Let's be quiet for a moment before we turn to God in prayer. O oh Lord, we give you thanks for the beauty that we can glimpse from our windows or on our daily exercise, for the hills and valleys shrouded in mist, for trees resplendent with autumn colour, for sunrise and sunset that does not cease. O oh Lord, we praise you for your goodness revealed in small things, a phone call from a friend, a wave from a passerby, a warm drink that comforts when we come in from the cold. O oh Lord, we worship you, our God who is ever faithful. Open our eyes to see more of your presence, our ears to listen to the cry of others. May we hear you speaking through our worship today that we may understand your kingdom comes in many ways to bring justice, mercy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We join together in the traditional form of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Bible passage today is read for us by our new circuit administrator, Jill Harper Hill, and will be followed by a reflection on the reading by the Reverend Trevor Capstick. Jesus tells the parable of the loaned money. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who calls his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money, to another, two talents, and to another, one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many more. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would receive it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the 10 talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Good morning, friends. It's uh, good to be with you again and sharing in this act of worship on this Sunday morning. Did you ever watch Time Team? on Channel 4 TV. 
You remember the programme, I'm sure. It was about archaeology and it was presented by Tony Robinson, the actor. And for 20 years or so, it was on our screens. Uh, they would televise numerous archaeological digs all around the British Isles and some even uh, abroad. One of the exciting things that happened quite often was that in digging, expecting to find a particular type of settlement, they sometimes uncovered finds that were unexpected and perhaps of greater interest and value than they could have imagined. And so digging down, expecting to find, say, remains of a medieval village, they sometimes found remains of Anglo-Saxon villages and artefacts from that era. And sometimes on the same site, they might have uncovered Roman coins and realized that the Romans were there all those years before. I sometimes think that's quite a good picture of what it's like to study the Gospels and maybe especially the parables of Jesus. We come to them expecting to find one thing, perhaps assuming we know what we're going to discover. But as we dig down, so to speak, we discover something quite different. Well, today's Bible reading the parable of the talents found in Matthew chapter 25 is an example of this. I think there's at least two different ways of interpreting this story. One that's more common to us and more traditional, we might say, and one that seems newer and more alternative. Most of us will have uh, learnt the story of the talents from Sunday school days if we attended uh, when we were children. Uh, we know it's a moral tale, really, um, on that uh, basic interpretation. It's about using our gifts and abilities responsibly, isn't it? In the story, the first two servants uh, did that, and they were commended by the master in the story. But the third servant didn't do that, and he incurred the wrath of his master. And so we could apply the story in this way, that... We are Christians, we are servants of God, uh, we're Christians, and we've, like those servants in the story, been given gifts, opportunities by God, tasks to do. And we're expected to fulfil our tasks, to use the gifts given to us in God's service and for the blessing of others. A talent, um, we think of it as in terms of maybe a, gi a gift or an ability or skill, but originally it was a weight of silver. Um, I'm told it was worth 15 years pay for a manual worker. One talent, one weight of silver was worth 15 years pay for a, a worker. So it was a precious amount. It was a large sum. We might say our lives are precious. The abilities we've been given are precious. So let's treasure them and use what we've been given. And the talents in the story uh, belonged to someone else, didn't they? Uh, they weren't actually belonging to the servants. They were given to the servants by the master. And we might apply that uh, understanding to ourselves and say, well, we as Christians are servants. Uh, we, are, we should be stewards. Our lives and abilities are to be used for God not just ourselves. But in recent times, scholars more and more have questioned this familiar traditional way of reading the story. And the story has been turned on its head. I want you to imagine uh, thinking of the story in this way, at least as one valid interpretation. What if the usually accepted villain in the story, that's the third servant, who hid the talent he'd been given, what if he actually is the hero in the story? And what if the other three main characters, the other two servants, who made a profit suspiciously, quickly and hugely, didn't they? What if they are people we shouldn't be trying to emulate? And as for that master, well, he seems such a harsh and unsympathetic figure, can hardly represent God, the loving God of Jesus, can he? Scholars tell us there's a social and economic background to this parable. It reflects how certain unscrupulous 
wealthy landlords might have been very keen to get their slaves, their servants to do their bidding and to uh, work hard uh, and in devious ways, um, raise more money for him, the master. And many of the landlords were absentee. This landlord was going away um, for a long time. And in Palestine in the first century, some of these landlords would have been harsh and unscrupulous types, just as we can find them in different parts of our modern world as well. The parable seems to be describing the world as it is, where there is aggressive acquisition, where there are threats and where there's violence. And these are powerful forces in people's lives. So who is the wise servant in the story? Is it one who colludes with the system or one who resists it? An alternative reading of this parable sees the third servant, the man who buried his talent, who we often want to blame, as actually being brave enough to swim against the tide. He refuses to engage in the unjust practices of this world. He's a hero because he stands up, knees knocking maybe, but he stands up with a degree of courage and tells the truth to the, po the powerful master. Indeed, I'm told when this story is read out in Middle Eastern churches, even today, people actually cheer the third servant when he makes his speech. In making a risky and determined stand against injustice and corruption at great cost to himself and his dependents, he perhaps becomes a role model for Jesus' alternative vision of the kingdom of God, a kingdom where people love mercy, act justly, and walk humbly with their God. Well, today is International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. Did you know that? This Sunday, halfway through November, in recent years, has been designated such a day when we can pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and no doubt other people of goodwill who are being unjustly treated for the beliefs they hold um, and Christians standing up for Jesus and his truth and his love under unjust regimes in the face of intimidation and persecution. Many, many Christians are suffering like this today as we gather like this for worship. So this is a day to remember our brothers and sisters and all who are suffering with our prayers and to seek to learn more and to pray more for them and maybe to give financially towards uh, their, uh, their help. Maybe this challenging day of prayer and this famous old parable, this gospel story, the one that we've thought we've known so well for so long and what else is there, what new else is there new to learn. Perhaps this parable, either in its traditional form of understanding or this newer alternative way, will challenge us all. It certainly challenges me. How am I? How are we using the talents we've been given? The talents could be money, it could be abilities, it could be our use of time, uh, our friendship. How are we using these gifts that we've been given in the service of God and for the blessing of others? And is our faith making a difference to our lives and helping to change the world around us? November is a month for remembering. And in this last week, we've been remembering those who have died in the two great wars and in other conflicts. And maybe also remembering great people of faith, people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German martyr during the Second World War comes to mind. People like Martin Luther King standing up for civil rights in the United States of America. These and many others are those who are willing to stand up, to tell the truth, to be counted, and to allow their faith to change their lives and to offer it to change the world. May God bless you and bless me as we seek 
to be faithful servants of God in our day and in our communities. God bless you. We now come to our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession this morning. So let us pray. Loving Lord, thank you for the unique talents with which each of us is born and for your support as we put them to good use with your guidance. We give what we have. We bring who we are, knowing that it can never be perfect and never enough. Yet we bring our talents, the gifts you have given us, the people you have made us, knowing that you accept us and love us. Help us share these gifts which we enjoy. Gifts of art, music and science, of gardening and engineering, of law, teaching and nursing, caring for children and the ill, of insight in making others laugh and forget their burdens. Lead us to use our talents wisely and develop them in our own way, as individual as our fingerprints, and reflecting the singular and unique personalities that we are. Use our lives and our living to build your people. Use your people to build a better world. Use this world to show the beauty of life with you. When we get complacent or downhearted, teach us to count our blessings. When we count our blessings, teach us to pray for those who need your blessing. We pray for those who use the talents you have given them, which put them in dangerous situations. They risk their lives in the struggle for justice and to establish peace on earth. Protect them and strengthen their will to continue in the disunity of today's world, the militarism and armaments race, and the human greed and injustice which are threatening life on the planet. Let us also not forget those who use their talents to quietly serve you, and suffer for preaching and following your good news. Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, and we pray that you will do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, that we will see much fruit come from countries where your church is under heavy persecution, a real lockdown. We think of China, where joining an online church can lead to government harassment, detention or imprisonment. We think of Nigeria, where Christians are attacked, kidnapped or executed by extreme Muslim factions. And we think of Mexico, where belonging to the wrong denomination leads to loss of utilities, eviction and paying illegal fines to restore access to very basic human needs. Help all those who suffer persecution for their faith in you to walk their special paths in a courageous manner that will enrich all who meet them on life's journey. We give thanks for the unity of the church throughout the world and implore you to send your spirit to teach us to be compassionate towards this whole human family. For peace, lead all nations into the path of peace and give us that peace which the world cannot give. Listening God, for our own neighbourhoods we pray for its people and its families, its history and its future promise, its politics and people, leaders and labourers, saints and sinners, 
with what we seek for our community and its people is peace and harmony and love and healing. And that during this time of pandemic, you remind us that everyone in need is our neighbour and that collectively their needs are met. Where there is imbalance, let there be equity. Where there is pain and sorrow, let there be rest. Where there is clamour and dispute, let there be reconciliation. May our way be bright, safe and joyful. May we create a noble life, be of help to others and leave behind lasting achievements and an inspiring legacy through talents well used. Hear these our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to Graham for leading us in prayers for others today and to all who've contributed to our worship this morning. Our closing hymn reminds us that God is our faithful, unchangeable friend. This, this is the God we adore. close with a blessing from the first letter to the Thessalonians. May God, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and will do this. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and in the coming days. Amen.